morning. Um, how are you? I hope you're doing fine. We will have a webinar about epoxy-based anchors under extreme conditions. And uh, at the beginning, I will talk, uh, cover some technical things regarding the webinar, and then we'll start our webinar itself. If you have any questions at any point of time, please feel free to answer the questions, and myself and my support team will try to answer you. Now, first of all, myself, Emil Bloom, I'm a senior field engineer in the UAE. I'm civil engineer, and my user ID will be for this webinar, Fisher Mea. Then I have my two colleagues here for the webinar support, Mr. Marsuk. He also deals with digital marketing in our company. And if you have any trouble, you can call him on his number. If you have any questions or connection problems, he will be happily assisting you. Also, we have for the Fisher support, Mr. Naveen. He is our marketing manager and his user ID for this meeting with the Fisher support. So you know, if someone from Fisher support is writing something, it's him. The time split, we will uh, do approximately 45 minutes of webinar. Then we will have 10 minutes of question and answers, maybe some more, depending on your uh, on the amount of questions. And then we will have a short poll and feedback session where we can uh, where you can submit your feedback about our webinar, what you like, what you don't like, what we should improve for the next time. So for the better experience of the webinar, two short things. We recommend to use Google Chrome or Firefox and Internet Explorer is not, not recommended by our marketing expert. They said that Internet Explorer might lead to some problems in the webinar. So this is the webinar screen, basically how you see it. And just wanted to cover the chat function. If you want to chat, you can put, you can click chat and chat here. If you have any questions, you can submit the questions. And in case, in the end, we have a poll for you. Basically this poll would be like the feedback form. So in the end, I will ask you to please join me and fill out this poll so we can see how we can improve as a company to give you next time a better feedback for our webinar. Okay, so now let's start with the case study of the Boston Tunnel. It's called also Big Dig. And I have a few pictures here. You can see the tunnel looks very beautiful and calm. Another one at night, tunnel is empty. And another one, now I want to ask you, what could have happened in this tunnel? You should know that this tunnel was the most expensive hydro project ever built in the US. It is a 2.4 kilometer long tunnel and it was supposed to be finished in 1998, but instead it was finished in 2007. So almost 10 year delay from the original point of finish. So I was always thinking that only the Germans are slow with building their airport, but apparently also the Americans might take some time to build their projects. And the original cost of this project was 190% overreached over the budget with a complete of 14.6 billion US dollar. So now you can see what kind of magnitude this project had for the region and for the country. So now my question to you, what do you think could have happened with this tunnel project? And why did it happen? So now I will try to answer these two questions to you in the following slides. As you can see, the shocking image of a car crashed under some plates. So what are these plates? What did happen here on these pictures? As you can see, actually the ceiling collapsed. There was a concrete ceiling, a false concrete ceiling on the top here, and the full concrete ceiling for this part actually fell down. So we can say that approximately 24 tons of suspended concrete ceiling buried this car and sadly the lady did not make it. After this event, there was many questions asked on why this happened and how can this be avoided the next time. Now I have two quotes and actually these quotes are from the official report from the federal government on why this accident happened. An epoxy formulation that was not capable of sustaining long-term loads over time the epoxy deformed and fractured until several ceiling support anchors pulled free and allowed a portion of the ceiling to collapse. So basically, a wrong epoxy was used and this wrong epoxy led to a failure. Even more ironic it gets as per Miss Deborah, she said, it's kind of ironic in a 14 billion project, said a board member, about $1.5 per anchor is what ended up bringing the ceiling down. So now you can imagine, 
they had to save approximately five to six dirham or uh, whatever currency you have in your country, 1.5 dollar per anchor. And because of this 1.5 dollar per anchor, at the end, a person died. And not only this, but also the whole the whole integrity of the tunnel was questioned for time to time. So now we will speak about further extreme conditions. And one of the most discussed topics is always high load requirements. So here you can see that I modeled a base plate in our CFIX software. It can be basically any base plate in any geometries. I just took this example. For example, if you want to fix a bollard or something similar. And it's not important which kind of product I use, but what I want to show you is something else. So I use diameter M30 with an embedment depth of 300 mm. So just keep this in mind. And my base plate, I will not change. So as you can see here, the shear force is 520 kilonewtons. So you might think, wow, 520 kilonewtons is a very, very high load. So what I want to show you here is not our product, but it is what it will do if you put an edge into this design. Now I have the same design and I added an edge distance here from the outer row of the anchor with 250 mm. Again, same product, same anchorage depth, everything the same, but I had to decrease the force. These forces are always selected so that the anchor is 100% utilized. So you can see the decrease. Now again, I will add another edge. I added an edge with 80 mm, as you can see here, and now the force turned out to be only 25 kilonewton, which is a huge decrease. So we will summarize, no edge, shear force, 25 kilonewton. We have an edge of 250 mm, which is a lot. If you think about reality, we don't have 25 centimeter edges everywhere. And then we have 80 mm edge distance, which is only eight centimeter, which is also the minimum di edge distance for diameter M30. And our shear force uh, actually is mixed up here. I'm sorry. You can see that there's been decrease for 25 and 520. So it's a huge difference in between which what, what you can get and what you had with distance. The conclusion is never use any technical data sheets for the design and always use the anchor design software or contact the Fisher support if you have any questions or any doubt regarding any designs. Now another topic is called high temperature. Why high temperature? I mean, if we go outside now, if I look outside, I think it is at least 45 to 46 degrees now in the UAE. Now, if we check the highest temperatures in the whole GCC region, we can see there's 45, 43, 53 degree in Saudi Arabia, measured in July 2017. It's 54 degree in Kuwait, 48 in Bahrain, a little bit cooler, Qatar, UAE and Oman around 50, 52 degrees. So it is quite hot in our region we can say. So now that my question to you, have you ever faced any challenges with chemical anchors due to the heat? I mean, it is extreme temperature. So maybe do you think there's fast curing of the chemicals? I mean, did it ever happen to you that the chemical on site actually cured too fast? Or that the chemical should be stored in a cool place? What did you think? Did you think about this? Did you consider this? These questions we will cover in the following slides. Also, do you think that there's any long-term effects due to higher temperature? Or do you think that the temperature does not matter for the anchor at all? And the anchor will always perform the same. I prepared a small comparison for this and I compared the bond strength. So basically, chemical bonded anchors are evaluated based on the bond strength. The bond strength is nothing else as a measurement on how good our certain chemical can glue to the concrete surface and how strong it can be. So I did a small comparison between the temperature range 3560, which stands for 35 short term and 60, uh, 35 long term and 60 short term and 50 short term and 72 short term and 50 long term. So again, here we can see a small comparison in the bond strength and we see it was 18, 4, 35, 60, and it went down to 17, 50, 72. Now, this might not seem like a big decrease because it's all, all, only a decrease in 5% of the bond strength. But if you think about that your steel beam or your concrete column is 5% overloaded, I'm sure that you will not accept this 
and also the consultant or the customer or the client will not be happy about this. And maybe you will also not feel safe if it will be the case for the concrete column or the foundation or whatsoever. So again, we need to take care about these things and we actually need to evaluate the higher temperature in our design and consider and ask ourselves, where is the application? Is it indoors? If it is indoors, the temperature of course is cooler. If it is outdoors, it is much hotter. And for this reason, then we need to adjust our design accordingly. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask, then we will answer them after our webinar. Now I'd have another comparison, um, again, with our Fissium Plus M12, threaded rod, correct, and again, you can see the bond strength here and the temperature here. And I also compare the competitor product. And this competitor product, um, I don't want to blame the competitor, I just wanted to show that there might actually be decrease or not a decrease in the bond strength. As we've seen in the previous slide for our product, there was a decrease. Now for this diameter, for example, there's no decrease in the bond strength. So we can be calm if we select diameter and 12 and crack concrete. However, it might be for some other products in the market that there might be even a more severe increase. And we can also notice that the temperature range here are much lower. So 2440 and 4370. So again, 24 degree long term and 40 degree short term is quite cold, I would say, for the region of GCC. So when you're going for the higher temperature range, we can see that there's quite a difference in the bond strength. Now we have the case of fire. And I have some questions for you. Is there a decrease of performance due to higher temperature? If there is one, as we just discussed, what do you think will happen in case of fire? I mean, obviously fire is much more hotter than the temperature outside right now. If there is a fire resistance classification for your project, do you think there is one? Do you know which one it is? Are 120 or maybe even 240 minutes? Or are all the structural connections? I got a small hint from my colleagues that I should check the chat because apparently there are some questions. So let me uh, clear or check the chat and see what questions you ask. Slide showing shear capacity and edge distance interchain. Yes, exactly. Mr. Deepak Sharma, this is absolutely correct. And I wanted to clarify this at the end also. I, um, by mistake, I interchanged this. And of course, the high capacity is towards the, I mean, you're talking, I will go back in the slide, no problem. We will go back and clarify this issue. But you, of course, we're talking about this case here. And you can see that for the, for no edge distance, um, it is actually the high capacity. And then for the edge distance of ATMM, it has to be the low capacity, which is mistakenly here changed. So you're absolutely correct. Of course, it means that if you have an edge distance, your load value is always smaller than it is if you have no edge distance. I think um, the slideshow, this was the most question asked. Does temperature also affect in RCC frame structure design? Well, um, I'm sure it does, but I would lie if I would say that I'm an expert in uh, RCC structure design. So of course the temperature might increase to some extent, but I don't think it is in a big extent. Like for, how, how can I say, like if you design your RCC structure, like as a car structure, I don't think there's any impact or I'm not aware of any impact at least. But if you now want to design, let's say, any post install rebar connection with the RCC structure, then uh, there might be an like decreasing performance, obviously. But for RCC structure as like cast structures, I don't think there's any decrease. I'm not aware of any. So again, I'm sorry for the interruption, but let's continue with our slides. So what I want trying to say here is that you should always check the temperature, the application temperature of where your anchor will sit. If it will sit, for example, let's take the project Dubai Mall. I'm sure everyone in GCC knows the Dubai Mall and you have a concrete column inside this mall. I'm sure that the temperature will never go above 22 degrees simply because Dubai Mall is always under air condition. 
But now let's say you have an application in the face of the slab and you need to fix a chemical for some reason and your facade is actually dark or, or even like black or gray, gray glass or gray toned or gray colored and the sun is shining on it, I'm sure you will reach temperatures of 80 to 100 degrees in this facade. So you always need to consider the temperature. Case of fire, the questions I asked just briefly, if there's a what do you think will happen? Do we have fire resistance classification for your project? 120 minutes or 100, uh, 240 minutes? And are all the structural connections which you have on your site, if you connect any steel beam or cantilever or something like this to a RCC structure, are these connections protected in such a way that the temperature will not increase? And I will show you now why this is so critical. And I was scared myself after I saw this for the first time. Now I just made a small, small comparison between the tensile design resistance for trailer rod M30 5.8. So basically, what does this mean? This means that uh, the resistance of an M30 rod 5.8 in uh, tension is, if there is a static case, is over 180 kilonewton. Okay. Now, if we take the same, the same, same tensile load and we cover it with our expert report, 120 minutes fire report, we have a load value of only 13 kilonewton. So you can see that the difference is not only 5% as mentioned before, but obviously if it is, gets hotter, the steel gets weakened a lot. And of course, since anchors are small steel elements compared to big structure, the stresses are decreased by a lot. Now also we have 120 minutes fire as per tier 20. So tier 20 is technical report 020, which basically is like the state of the art report for any fire design for anchors. But this report, how can I say, is more conservative. So that is why it is the value in this report is even more or less than as per our expert report, which was tested for our product itself. But still, you can see that uh, fire design is plays an important topic in the safety of the structure. So we have decreased to almost 6.9% of the tensile design value NRDS. So now I want to ask you one question. When was the last time you did an anchor design and you checked also the fire capacity of this design? We just got a question now. Um, I'm not sure about the name, I'm sorry, but you asked, um, it was Mr. Michael Nugugi, and he asked if there's any possibility to protect the anchoring points at, from severe temperature like fire. Of course there is, I mean, there's many companies out there who provide fire protection boards or fire protection sprays or, or shot treat or different things. So with these things, you can protect your anchor from, from the severe condition of fire and you can cover the anchor so that the temperature might not go up to almost thousand degrees, but it might be less. So these precautions should be made. If you don't make any of these precautions or your, and your anchor is directly, how can I say, in fire or directly mm, objected to fire, you should consider this in your design at all times. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask the Fisher support in your countries or subsidiary or even email us. We will show our email address at the end of this webinar. I just want to cover it briefly because there's many, many topics, but if you have more in deep questions, feel free to, I will answer them at any time for you. Now we have another topic, which is a lot discussed in the Middle East and in the GCC region, as per my knowledge, is seismic action. So again, the question, does your project have seismic requirements? Have you ever done a seismic anchor design? So I think that the answer for the first question will probably be yes for some of the people, but I'm also quite sure that the answer for the second question for most of the people will be no. And the reason is that we have some logo, whatever it might look like, this is the Fisher logo for seismic, and these logos are kept inside the data sheet. And many people actually think that, okay, just because I have this logo in our catalog or in the data sheet, I don't need to check any seismic design. But actually, did you know that the capacity of an anchor is decreased in case of seismic loading compared to static loading? And this makes sense, and I will explain to you why. Seismic testing 
Anchor testing is much different than from the static load evaluation. And one of the main differences is the crack. So for example, if you want to test an anchor under seismic conditions, you place the anchor exactly in the crack. And this crack has a width of 0 0.8 mm. So now you can imagine 0 0.8 mm, it sounds small, but I can assure you 0 0.8 mm is actually visible. And for example, if you design RCC structures, at least in Europe, according to Eurocode, the crack width will go up either to 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 mm only. So we can see that in case of seismic, of course, the whole building is shaking and the RCC structure is under heavy stresses and thus my cracks might open. So what now if my anchor is sitting in such a crack? Of course, the load capacity will not be the same as it can be if the anchor is sitting somewhere in a non crack concrete under compression. So again, with that, I'm doing the short comparison to show you what this decrease might look like. Again, FCM plus, M20, threaded rod, doesn't really matter. I just took some example where the, uh, the gap is big. And again, our bond strength, so the gluing capacity of our chemical against the drill hole concrete, the wall. So we have the static performance in cracked, which is 8.5 Newton per square millimeter. And then we have the seismic performance category C2, which is the most severe seismic performance category. That's why it is called C2. There's C2 and C1. And for the C2, for example, as I mentioned, the crack width is 0 0.8 mm. And we can see that now the bond strength is going down to all like to 5 Newton per square millimeter. And this means it is a decrease of almost 45% in the bond strength. So now again, you can ask yourself, now, inshallah, I hope it will never happen, an earthquake happens. And my anchor was designed for 100%. But it is designed, for example, in the ceiling and all the low load is dead load. So this load will also be there in case of seismic actions. Will my anchor be able to withstand all these forces or will it just fall down? So it's also important to not only do the fire design or to the design for the hot temperature, but always do the design for seismic action also. Please keep this in mind. And if you have any questions, contact any of the Fisher support. Now there was a question from the webinar I wanted to answer. And what the question was how to calculate the shear and tension capacity of Fisher mechanical bolt manually. This was Mr. Manoj Kumar. Um, I don't recommend you to calculate any of our anchor bolt capacities manually. It can be done. And there's also data sheets with values on how you can check the shear capacity and the tension capacity. However, it is only, how can I say, possible or easy or economical to do this for one single anchor. As soon as you have a group of anchor with two anchors or four anchors, it is very complex. I mean, I'm not saying you cannot do it, it is possible. However, it is uneconomical because you will waste a lot of your time. And also it is not safe because no one is checking if you're doing the right job. So for more than one anchor, I always recommend you to use our design software, CFIX, and contact our technical support. And then you can model any base plate geometry and then you can do your case and solve it as per your on-site requirement. So I hope this solves your question. If not, please let me know so maybe we can contact each other via email or phone after the webinar and I can help you on this topic. Now, the next extreme condition is diamond core holes. Um, I hope this is more like a funny topic or at least, at least a little bit because there's some nice pictures. So we have high strength concrete. We all know the requirements for the RCC slab, concrete strength C50-60 is nothing new anymore and it's getting even higher for some special projects or applications, I'm sorry, for bridges or similar. We have big diameters of rebar. So here I found a picture of a concrete column and this diameter of rebar as per the internet is apparently 50 mm. So we have 50 mm rebar diameters used for a concrete column. Can you imagine? You need to fix something in this column. We have heavily reinforced concrete, as you can see. I don't think there's any space even left for the concrete. So imagine you need to drill and anchor MEP services or a facade or anything in this concrete member. Then we have high embedment depth. Sometimes if the forces are too huge, especially for rebar application, we have embedment depth like 500 mm, 600 mm. So you need to actually drill a decent amount of depth into the concrete, which of course, 
is not very easy, but there's an easy solution for this. It's called diamond core drilling. So with diamond core drilling, you avoid all these problems in one step. However, you create new problems, of course. Let's discuss why. First of all, I question to you, does the consultant, excuse me if, if you are a consultant yourself, please don't uh, be offended by this. Does the consultant know you're cutting all his rebars? Because I'm sure he does not. Most of the times, the rebars are there for a reason. And when you cut them, you might influence the structural integrity of the whole building. I mean, the RCC, there was a question about RCC design. So I'm sure if you do RCC design, you put the rebar not just for fun, you put it there because the tension resistance is required in this zone. So now imagine the MEP contractor comes there and drills all these fancy holes for his drop-in anchors and he cuts all your rebars. So your slab, the integrity of the slab or of the beam is actually questionable. This is my first question. Second question. I'm sure all of you have drilled the one or the other hammer drill hole on site and also did some diamond coring. So I'm sure you have felt the difference if you touch a diamond core hole, how smooth a diamond core hole is because it's almost like it's cutting the concrete basically. So it's cutting and grinding it, and it is very, very smooth compared to a hammer drilled hole, which is roughened, roughed of course. So now, since we know that this diamond core hole is so smooth, as we all know from our experience, do you think there should be any special precautions or installation steps which should be specially added for diamond core holes? And if what, maybe some of you know some steps already, how could these steps look like? Then again, might there be an influence on the load capacity? In the past slides or topics, we have learned that almost anything can influence the load negatively. So let's see what is going on with diamond core holes. We have a solution, easy solution, Fisher Fissium Plus. Now I'm not promising you that Fisher Fissium Plus is like Aladdin. It's recently launched in the movies and it will help you and solve all your problems and your free wishes and you can solve any of your problems. But it is a small step towards helping you as a customer to solve your on-site requirements as per your demands. And I will explain to you why. The first thing is our mortar is tested and approved in diamond core holes, even for seismic actions. The second easy step is that actually in our software, we spoke about manual anchor design. This is another reason why I don't recommend it to do manual anchor design. Okay. For mechanical anchor, it might be different, but in the software, you have so many options. You can just simply go, you can click coring, you can select diamond drilling or diamond uh, hammer drilling, and you can easily verify um, how it can be in, uh, check if the capacity is good or not. So again, if you go to our software, you will automatically, like you just need to think, okay, I have diamond core drill drillers. I will select this and I'm good to go, I'm safe. The software is doing the thinking for me. I don't need to think about it. Because you as a project engineer, you or, or whatever your job description might look like, I'm sure you have many, many, many other problems and diamond cord holes should not be one of them. So now our installation steps, since we discussed if there might be some special precautions to be taken. First step, we drill our diamond core hole. Then we remove the core and we break it out and we start flushing the hole with water until clean water comes out. Why? Because we all saw the slime, which is coming, the smud, which is inside the diamond core hole. And of course we need to remove the slime because it's like soapy a little bit. And soapy and chemical bond or glue does not go well hand to hand. After this, we need to do some cleaning. Um, the cleaning basically consists of three steps. First, you blow out the drill hole two times either with a hand blowout pump or for bigger diameter or depth with a compressor. Then you brush the drill hole two times and then again you clean or blow out the drill hole two times to remove any dust. After this, you will fill in the chemical from the bottom of the drill hole until you have put enough chemical in the drill hole and you will insert your threaded rod. And always make sure that the small amount of chemical is coming out of the drill hole. So you can actually assure that the required amount of chemical is inside the drill hole. And if you are a consultant or you are a quality inspector and you want to check if the anchor was installed properly, this is how you can see, okay, there's enough chemical inside my drill hole. It's good to go. After this, um, 
well, you should wait till the curing time is over. The curing time depends on the product. And of course, if it's hotter outside, it will be faster. And after this curing time is over, then you can tighten your nut. But please don't overshoot the value for T-ins. T-ins, the, the installation torque moment, and this torque moment value should not be undershot at all, overshot at all times. And there are some questions regarding our software CFIX. Um, I will cover them after the webinar just shortly. I will open the software and just show it because I think it's much easier to show you after this. Ah, now there's a very good question, which I just wanted to say from Mr. Michael Nagugi, that if you need to roughen the drill hole when doing diamond core holes, this is a very brilliant question because as you can see in our installation steps, you don't have to do this. Now, I know where this question comes from and why you're asking this, because there are some products in the market which actually require this additional step of roughening, because we discussed in the beginning that diamond core holes are much smoother than hammer drill holes. But as you can see, for Fisher, there's no additional roughening required. So the installation steps are very simple and you can follow them regardless of hammer drilling or diamond drilling. The only additional step will be, of course, the drilling process and the cleaning with water itself. I hope this answered your question. If not, we can chat afterwards if you would like to. Now, another extreme condition is always design life expectancy. Well, I mean, there is the first question is, what is an ETA? ETA is a European technical assessment and is basically the, the basis document or technical specification, or let's say, let's call it the mother data sheet of all our approved anchors. And not only ours, but of the competition worldwide also. I mean, generally in the market. This European technical assessment describes all the product characteristics of any product. Now the question is, what is the design life requirement for your project? Are you building a small house 20 years, 30 years, depending on the country? Or maybe you're building something else. Just think about what is the design life requirement for your project? Or maybe there is not even design life requirement. Do you know? Also, did you know that the verification and assessment methods of a usual ETA, what I just described of this mother document, this mother sheet of any anchor design is an assumption based of a working life of the connection for at least 50 years. Well, it means at least 50 years. But the question is, what if it is more? So now I actually copied it from the ETA. It's based to the assumption of working life of rebar connection at least 50 years. Now we come back to the question, what is the design life requirement for your project? Is it? Some projects have intended working life of 100 to 200 years, like tunnels, bridges, or skyscrapers. Do we have any of these projects? Yes or no? So we can see here a nice fancy bridge, the highest, currently highest tower in the world, or a tunnel. So if you work in any of these projects, you might need a higher design life than 50 years. So now my question to you is, do you think it would be convenient to renew the anchor connection after 50 years? Because as we learned now, the anchor or the basic document, the ETA, only covers or is, how can I say, is made to give a life expectancy of 50 years, which by the way, is not a warranty at all. It's just a design life expectancy. So if everything is correct, if all the installation steps are followed correctly, if the anchor is not overloaded, if the corrosion environment is uh, in, uh, like not harassing the anchor in its condition, if everything is fine, then we can expect a design life of 50 years. So what did we do? We thought, how can we improve this? We have an independent techni technical evaluation for up to 120 years of service life. It is by the EEA, which is an engineering bureau, and they did this expert report for us. And this covers on how we can design for more than 50 years, and I will show you how. So basically, there is a reduction factor called alpha, 120 years, and this reduction factor can now reduce the capacity 
depending on the on-site conditions. So now, for example, we have our basic tau RK value, which is basically the bond strength, which we've been speaking about during the full presentation at all this time. So now we want to add to this value, we need to multiply or the, like reduce this value by a factor called alpha 120 years. So now, for example, if I have, let's say that I have an M10 anchor in 35 environment and crack concrete, I know that my reduction factor is 0 0.85. So I almost have the full capacity of the anchor. However, I need to reduce. There is one question I will come to it later, since it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so now I see that, for example, for diameter M8, however, there is a big reduction. So for these reductions, I need to take it into account. So with this design life expectancy evaluation report, we can now cover also uh, more years than 50 years. And if you have any inquiries regarding this topic, please feel free to contact us so we can support you. Another case study I want to show you, which is a project which uh, we did in the past in the Middle East, in Dubai. It's actually Dubai Harbor extension. They're building like a small new city in the Dubai Harbor. And uh, the application was very simple. Basically, they wanted to fix this ladder onto the concrete wall of the harbor itself. And uh, they used, therefore, anchor bolts M20. And the challenge was to fix not only above water, but also fixed, as you can see, underwater. And of course, it's, it's the sea. It is seawater or salt water. So <clears throat> what we did is we went there, we instructed the divers, and the divers actually installed our chemical, as you can see, underwater. So they drilled a hole with pneumatic drill bit. Sadly, we don't have any footage of the underwater installation. They drilled the dr hole with the drill bit. They cleaned the hole properly, and then injected our chemical and installed our anchor. And after this, we did pull-out tests. We did one pull-out test underwater, so you can see here, my colleague is standing on the cage and the diver is down below the water. He's having the cylinder and we're pumping here to put the pressure on the cylinder and doing the pull-out test in the water. And also one we did outside of the water. So the cylinder looked like for underwater and overwater pull-out tests. And we actually can assure or what happened in the pull-out test report that the multiple of the required design was achieved during both pull-out tests. So regardless of the anchor being installed in dry conditions here in some concrete block, which was standing around, or actually in the real application scenario, underwater, in seawater, we did achieve our required design load values. I think it was around 180 kilonewton, and then we stopped and 90 was required only for this M20 volt. Now, another topic, concluding this wet or underwater application of the Dubai Harbor case study. So, our ETA, the European Technical Assessment, covers our filled holes. But this is only wet or water filled. Now, there's a difference between water filled and underwater. So, if we actually do an application underwater, this would be outside of the ETA. Why? Because in the ETA, there's no scope for such an application. There's no test, test guideline for this application. So we can do it based on engineering judgment, and we can prove that the anchor functions well under your conditions underwater with pull-out tests. So for these applications, there's one thing you have to keep in mind, and it's that the curing times have to be doubled. Since the chemical is surrounded by water, it is just harder or it takes more time for the chemical to dry. So that's why the curing times have to be actually doubled. Another thing which is nice, if you put some chemical, which is a chemical which is usually not good for health in drinking water or in any water, is that we have the NSF NC61 Drinking Water System Components Health Effect Certificate from NSF and NSF is nothing else than the Public Health and Safety Organization. It's in, from the US. And this covers that FISCM Plus is tested in drinking water systems and has no harm to such. So now, obviously, if FISCM Plus, if it, once it is cured, obviously, it's only the cured chemical. You cannot use, the, like, if you put the chemical, like, just 
dip it into the water, of course, there will be some effect. But the cure chemical has no harm to any animal also, or any sea creatures in any kind. So we can install our anchors under seawater, and we don't need to be thinking, okay, now we put some chemical there, and now there will be no more fish in Dubai, or no more fish in the UAE. No, nothing will happen, it will all be fine, and we have a certificate for this application area also. Now, just another extreme condition, I call it the day in the life of a cartridge. We have our cartridge, it's a solid hard cartridge. Um, I hope all of you have seen it before and using our product. Um, it's robust on site because it is actually solid plastic. It has scale units. As you can see here, I took this as actually a print from the label and on the side of the cartridge, on both sides, you have scale units. And one scale unit means two milliliter. So now you might ask yourself, what does scale unit, what is the benefit? If you remember, I told you that when you do the anchor installation, you should always check that there's small chemical amount coming out. So the scale units helps you to actually measure how much chemical you need for each drill hole. And we can support you. For example, let's say I will, our engineers will tell you you need 20 ml for this application per drill hole. So now you know I need 10 scale units. So now your labor, when they're pumping the chemical, they just need to check, okay, I use 10 scale units, I'm good. I can now take my gun out and put in the treaded rod. So again, this will save your money if you do it properly, and we will support you doing so. Usability up to the best before date. There's some cartridges or chemical, which once you use them, you need to throw them away, or you use them till they're finished. But with our chemical, you can simply just leave it after the usage and use it till the best before date, and it will work fine. There will be no decrease in whatsoever. Of course, you need to pay attention for the shelf life, to use it before, the best before date, but we have 36 months. So 36 months, in my opinion, is quite a lot. So even after you deliver the chemical to your site or to your customer, you still have enough time to, to use it on site. And maybe even if there's leftovers, you can use them for the next project because 36 months, it's three years. And as we know, GCC, all the projects, they're quite fast. And another important thing is, that this ensures safety and is an economical solution because you will avoid waste and also safety. Why? Because once the chemical is inspired, expired, I would not recommend or we don't give any warranty. You should not use it after it is expired at all. So once the chemical is expired, you should not use it. It's not like your yogurt, which you might want to use one day after expiry date and you think it will still be fine. The chemical is not good after the expiry date at all. So we spoke about storage also, and I asked you, how do you store your cartridges on site? I mean, I didn't read the answers, but I'm sure that most of the sites don't have any AC cooled rooms. But you should know it is actually printed on every label of every cartridge for every chemical injection system that there is a storing temperature. And the store, it should be stored in a cool and dry place plus 30 degrees. And as we all know, the degrees outside, the temperature outside is getting pretty hot pretty fast. So if you store it in your car, this is not a suitable storage area, not at all. And the problem with this is that we don't have any information or data on what will happen with the chemical if you store it above 30. There will be a decrease in load capacity for sure and decrease in safety. But now you might say, okay, how much? We don't know it and we don't give any commitments whatsoever if you don't store your chemical properly. So please, I have an appeal to you all, if you buy the chemical to ensure the safety of everyone, just make sure that you store the chemical in some warehouse where it is cool, there's some AC or other possibilities. You can also put them in cold water if you want. It's also possible. I mean, nothing will happen if you put the cartridge into water, they're tight. So you can also keep them cool until you use them for the installation. Now we spoke a lot about FISI-M Plus, 390S, and we didn't want to make this webinar too much about the product. I mean, we had to speak a little bit about some product just to have a context, but sometimes I get this question, what does FISI-M Plus, 390S even stand for? So I will try to explain. FIS stands for nothing else than Fisher Injection System. 
Then we have EM plus. EM plus is nothing else but the product name, which is EM plus, and also the E in this case indicates that it is epoxy. There's also other types of chemical like V for vinyl ester or P for polyester, but in this case E indicates epoxy. Now, what does this 390S mean? Well, 390 is pretty simple. 390 basically means only that the volume of the cartridge is 390 ml. Simple. Next one, S. Well, S, I don't know who came to this idea and when it was, but S apparently, I had to learn, stands for shuttle because the two components are kept side by side. And I put this picture of a space shuttle. So all of you remember, I'm sure, that there was a space shuttle where there was the rocket and the spaceship side by side. So basically for our cartridge, it's the same. We have the mortar here in the blue cover and then the hardener, which is here dark gray without any cover, you can see. So this is why it's called S. So basically, this is how Fisher labels our products. Now, uh, I talked a lot, I will talk some more, but I want to show you also some video. We did some small installation pull-out test video, and I just want to show you how we did it. So here we tested our Fission Plus. We did an installation and pull-out test in our warehouse. And here my colleague is showing the different products, the static mixer, the Fisher threaded rod, and we have now this hollow drill bit, which removes the dust while drilling. We have Fisher dispenser gun, we have our drill hole cleaning brush. So we have all the necessary tools which we need for our installation. You can so you can see he's an expert. He's wearing uh, gloves to protect himself and a safety vest must be worn at all times on site because safety is the most important thing. So now here you can see what is actually going on. It is called hollow drill bit. It is a, quite a new technology. It is maybe two to three years in the market. And it is basically sucking out the dust or any dirt from the drill hole while drilling the drill hole. So we will do a comparison now and during the video we'll show and I've seen understand. So here we're drilling the hole and we're also checking the time of how long it took to drill the drill hole. So you can see he's an expert, he's going quite fast. He's done this a lot of times before. And now we're drilling the drill with a conventional hammer drill bit. Also same embedment depth, it is 100 embedment depth and diameter M, like diameter for drilling is 12, and uh, we use threaded rod M10. So now he removes the dust, he brushes the drill hole, twisting and brushing, and removing the dust again. As you can see, of course, the steps take more time. So now on the right side, you can see that the Fisher drill hole, FHD is there, and the conventional drill bit is on the left side. And the time required is actually a difference of 25 seconds, which is almost 40 5%. So now you might say, okay, but this drill bit, it is so magic. Can it really make the drill hole clean? So here we can see a very, very important step. I will go back to highlight it once more. When you start a new cartridge, it is very important that at the beginning, you spend around 10 centimeters of chemical, as you can see here, and you just wasted on the concrete or on the floor or whatever, or in some piece of uh, cardboard, just to check if the chemical is mixed properly. And you should only use properly mixed chemicals. Now, my colleague is inserting the chemical, and as you see, he knows exactly how much chemical he needs. That's why he's pulling it out on time. Zack, now he is done. Now he will insert the threaded rod. He will twist it a little bit because always you should rotate the threaded rod to make sure that there's no air kept inside. And now you can see that there's some chemical coming out. It might be a little bit too much, but actually this is good. So the quality engineer or everyone can check how much chemical came out from the drill hole. And it's also written like this in the approval. Now we're doing the second drill hole. Even we had a small guest, as you can see. And the second drill hole, our expert also installs the threaded rod in the same way he did for the first drill hole. Now, after this, we had to wait. Um, we waited till the next day. 
you need to wait only approximately five hours. And then we did the pullout test. First, we did the pullout test for the Fisher drill bit FHD. So for the hollow drill bit with no additional drill hole cleaning, and we wanted to check the load, which we will achieve without any additional cleaning. This was actually myself doing the test. Again, it's always important to wear gloves. So now we fixed the cylinder and we start the pullout test and you can see on the right here the force, which is increasing and increasing and increasing. I'm taking a little bit more time because actually at some point it got pretty hard to twist the pullout machine. So we reached almost 40 kilonewton. which is equal to four tons. And now we see that the steel starts to yield. And uh, we discuss about the design resistance. So the design resistance of this anchor is 19.33 kilonewton. As we know, one kilonewton is 100 kg. So it is 1.9 ton. And the recommended resistance with a more safety factor is 13.8. And our test result was 41.1 kilonewton. Actually, we tested both anchors, the FHD and the other one to compare, but we only showed you one. So what happened if we continue our test? We can see that the anchor, the steel yields and yields. And then because the anchor was under so much pre-stressing force, actually what happened that our pullout machine, it flew off and it flipped over. And you can see here in both tests, I will go back and show you once more. In both tests, you can see that steel failure happened here as well as on this anchor. So yield happened for both anchors. So we can see that even though we did not clean the drill hole especially, but we used this special technique called FHD, hollow drill bit, which sucks out the drill dust, we achieved more than enough load in both cases. So I want to thank you for your attention for this video. And now we will continue with the one of the last slides just to summarize FCM Plus once more. Um, basically, it has an ICC approval for cracked concrete or for concrete in general. It has rebar approval according to ETA. For those who are not aware of what ICC stands for, we spoke about ETA. ICC ES basically is the evaluation service of the ICC. And the ICC is an American organization who also evaluates certain civil construction materials and thus gives also a report similar to the ETA as for they give it for Europe. We have a seismic approval. We have an approval for concrete as uh, also for uh, ETA, so rebar approval and concrete approval like anchors approval. We have an, a fire resistance certificate, R240 minutes for the variety of fixings. We have the highest loads in its class. We have diamond drilling without ruffling. Again, answering to this question, we don't require any special roughening in diamond core holes. We have reduced edge distance and spacings. We have NSF tests. So we are NSF tested for drinking water and fire certificate already as mentioned also for R120 and 140, 240. So at this point, I would like to thank you for your attention. It was very nice to have this webinar. It is, I'm not doing many webinars. This was my third one only so far. And any feedback would be highly appreciated, whether you have negative feedback, if you want to optimize something for the next webinar, if you cut off the connection, if you want me to, to go ask, answer some more questions next time whatsoever. And please, if you have any further inquiries, you can email them to inquiry at fisher.ae. But now I will answer, go for the chat and answer the questions. And also, if you have more questions, please feel free to answer them at any time. So one question now from Mr. Pedro Espinas, excuse me. Is there any rule of thumb for the value of factor K applied to the dead load for the seismic load of non-structural item seismic force? Um, I'm not sure actually what you mean. Um, I'm completely lost. You mean maybe the like the, the soil factor and the gravity factor of the seismic loading and how you have any thumb rule for this? 
I'm not aware. Maybe you can write, make an email, or I will try to contact you, then we can discuss, and I will find out what exactly you meant. And where we could find seismic design software to plan supports. Um, actually, if you want to, I mean, supports, I think you mean MEP supports. So Fisher does have a software for, it's called Install Fix, where you can, uh, we can, you can design any MEP supports. However, sadly, these supports are not seismic, uh, not like fit for seismic. But if you have any seismic design requirements, uh, you can contact us. We did many design seismic design projects in the past. So for example, if you need to add a bracing or you have a firefighting pipe with, with four bracings or something like this, or let's say you have like a regular frame, but now you want to brace it. So we can assist you with this. We have our uh, softwares, which are uh, or Excel sheets and how we can assist you with these kind of applications. Uh, stop sharing on the questions. Yeah. Okay, so now I will disable my screen sharing, but um, I will check all the questions you asked. Asked, and um, if I missed anyone, please apologize. Can we get a response, please? So, new messages. Which browser are you using? Can you check? Well, which browser I'm using? Oh, I'm. Uh, can you check your internet? How to calculate the shear integer capacity of Fisher mechanical bolts manually? So yeah, we already discussed this, um, how to calculate the capacity of more than one bolt. It's very complicated. So I recommend you always use our anchor design software. So I just open it. So for example, you can select here now a one bolt, or you can select a number of bolts, let's say like four bolts or something like this. You can model your case. You can select the different type of profiles you have, for example, if you have a Z profile or a Perlin or whatsoever, you can input your loads and then at the end you can generate a nice printout report. So if you have questions regarding the software, I will also post the link for the download later so you can download it and if you face any issues, you can ask us always. So I just want to show the report at the end, for example, now I have a failed design because I have put too much load, so it succeeded. So actually on every page we have this watermark and you can see here is 140% overutilized, but in general, all the formulas, all the design is here and you can check it if you wish. So this is what I would recommend you to do instead of the uh, mechanical design or hand design. I think what is the maximum diameter for coring? I'm not a coring expert, but I think you can go uh, up to at least 200, 250 mm, I'm sure. Um, now, I think we answered all of the questions or most of the questions. I don't think, I hope I hope we did not miss any questions. If we missed, please um, send us per email. Uh, actually, I lost um, this uh, connection. I can share this presentation. I need to check it. Um, also, like to have the pullout video, which was from the web. Yeah, I'm sure we can share the video. I mean, the, this full webinar will be shared anyways online. Um, how much percentage of actual design to be applied in pullout test if I don't want to demonstrate concrete? Um, it depends. So, if you do a, any pullout tests um, on site and you need to use this anchorage afterwards, I would never go over the um, value, the, over the design value, which is mentioned in the design report, simply because if you go for higher value, it should not fail, but there's a small percentage, that's why there's a safety factor that it can fail. Diamond coring, we answered the policy and later. So there's some questions and my recommendation would be, um, I apologize, we will collect all the questions. We will make an Excel sheet and I will reply to every single questions with facts and data. And then we will send all these questions to you guys and you can then uh, read it. Maybe also you're interested in some other people's question. So we will do this uh, thing. There's eat next week, but after eat for sure you will get it. And then you can actually check and study it. And if you then have any questions, I'll put my email address also, then you can contact me directly if you wish. So now I would ask you to go to the poll section, as you can see here on the right side. And uh, I just wanted to invite you, so please give your feedback for the webinar. Just click the questions where you like the webinar, invite if you faced any challenges, uh, what did you, like how did you get to know about our webinar and so on and so on. 
So if you would please take this two minutes to answer our polls, I would be very thankful. Um, otherwise, I wish you um, Eid Mubarak next week and uh, have a nice day. And thank you for joining me. Bye-bye from Dubai.